today, everybody, we're going to be doing lateral loads in RISA. Uh, this is a large topic. Um, when I started preparing for this presentation, I thought to myself, gosh, I think I chewed out a lot of a lot for this presentation. So we're going to take it in kind of in some distinct areas. I want to make sure that we hit um, a, a variety of different things. Uh, maybe we'll, we'll create a different webinar from some of the ones that people are interested in beyond this. Um, but today, we're going to talk about RISA 3D. Uh, 9.1 version, that's our current version, and RISA Floor uh, 5.1. Um, RISA Floor will, will be specifically uh, talking about the building design and how we take that uh, building design for the lateral loads. Um, so one of the things that for the overview of this presentation, we'll, we want to talk about the wind loads, uh, seismic nodes and notional loads. Those are the three types of loading. And as I reviewed this, um, I thought to myself, the loading is probably the biggest question. Um, there's lots of stuff we can ask about the design uh, once we get to that stage, but today's webinar we're going to really talk about is how to load the model um, for these, these out-of-plane wind loads, seismic loads, and notional loads. Um, we're also going to talk about diaphragms. Uh, they inherently play a role in the loading. So how does the diaphragm play into that? Um, we'll talk about the different kinds of diaphragms we have available in RISA 3D, and uh, we'll go from there. And then load combinations. Um, so loads by themselves don't really do much to your model until you put them in combination in the model. So we're going to get that all the way to that stage in this, in this presentation today. Um, specifically for codes that we'll be talking about. So the IBC 2009 is, one, is what we'll talk about mostly here. Um, but as we look at the IBC, a lot of it defers to the ASE 7. So we're going to be talking about the ASE 705. Um, two, the 2010 version will be released in the next version of RISA 3D, and that will be out um, in a couple months. So we will want to talk about that as well. It makes um, some big changes to some of our modeling and some of our loads, so we'll want to make sure we, we are, have that on our horizon. Starting out, let's talk about with some of the wind loading that we do. Uh, RISA 3D has some automated wind loads. And what we'll see here that is that you can pick um, the, the wind code that you're using, the ASE 705 is what we'll talk about today, but we do have foreign codes available. We have Canadian and Mexican and Indian uh, wind codes available as well. So you can select from those. Uh, you can tell the program the wind speed, the occupancy category, the exposure category. Those are going to be the three cr uh, critical numbers that you need to put into this dialog. You can leave the topographic uh, categories, or excuse me, factors out, and the directional uh, factor is typically going to be a 0.85. Um, so this is assuming that we're using the main wind force resisting system, as per the ASE 7, rigid enclosed buildings of all heights. So one of the main pieces there is that we're assuming it's a rigid uh, enclosed building. Um, that, that's a pretty uh, big assumption, and you may not fit into that with all of your buildings or, or your structures. So this would be the only time we would want to use this type of, of loading. But, um, but it does get us that MWFRS uh, uh, versus the components and cladding. Uh, that would not be applicable in, in the building type of setting here that we're doing for the automatic loading. Uh, we're, we have an option here to do the base elevation to tell the program what level the, the wind is going to start at. So from this picture, we can see that the base elevation allows us to set maybe a basement level or an underground parking or something that is not going to be exposed to the wind. So we can set that location to be maybe 10 feet. Um, a lot of buildings are just going to leave that at zero and that the full building is exposed to wind. Uh, as we look at how the, the loading here gets applied, the wind load comes in from the side, the wall wind load here we can see. It's applied at the left-hand side of this arrows, and it gets dro dropped into the diaphragm level. So all the wind gets added up along that, wi that wall here, and then we take that and we put it into the resisting diaphragm at each level. So you're going to see the same thing happen on the roof. On the roof, we're going to count up all that distributed load on the roof level, and it's going to go down to the diaphragm below it. So we're going to see that we're going to have forces in those diaphragms resisting that wind load that we are applying. Um, the wind loads that we apply here, a uh, good descriptor here is to see this picture from the ASE 7, figure 6.6, .6, 
we can see that this is for the enclosed buildings here, um, as well as partially enclosed. But what it does show us here is that it gives us a picture of, of how the wind is, is distributed into the building on the walls. And then we see we're going to get wind loads categories X and Z for the two different directions. So as the global direction X wind is blown on there, we can see we're going to see wind on each, each side of the building, um, also in the Z direction. We're also going to do some sloped uh, wind loading for you. So if you look at here, we're going to see we're going to do the WLX plus R. That would be the positive roof direction in the X direction and the negative roof direction in the X direction. So you'll see from this is a kind of a great picture on the top right corner. The gable hip roof shows us that that is not going to be the exact same quantity of wind on one direction, one face of the, the roof versus the other face of the roof. So when we do the automated loading here, we'll see that it actually gets broken out into two different categories. So we also do some automatic seismic loading. Uh, very similarly, you're going to get a screen where you get to put in the, the parameters of that seismic category that you have. Uh, you choose the code. You choose all the CT there. You can choose your uh, your R there for yourself. But one of the things, response modification coefficient, you choose what, what I've read through the code. Some folks say, well, what if I have a mixed R? Uh, typically, you're going to just go with the most stringent R. Um, so in this example here, this picture, I have three in there. The period can be left blank. The program is going to calculate the period for you um, based on some calculations in the ASC 7. If you actually happen to know your period, you can put that in and overwrite that. But there's going to be some calculations based in there. Uh, the occupancy, occupancy category is going to be filled out for you. As well as now you're going to need to go to the specifics of what your location are, SD1, SDS, and S1. Now, a lot of times folks uh, look for these numbers. The best way I've always found to is to, to look at the map in the, in the ASE 7, but also just make sure that you um, dial in the exact location of the address and make sure you're, you're, you're on these numbers exactly. Um, so we're going to do this again based on um, a building structure. So we're assuming that it has diaphragms. And we're going to be doing it based on the equivalent lateral force method. So that's how we're going to calculate that. And you can find that in uh, section 12.8 for the seismic loads. Uh, seismic weight is something that's going to be important. So uh, for wind, we're not worried about the weight of the structure. But for uh, seismic, we need to know about the weight of the structure. If you're coming in from RISA floor, it's pretty easy to do this calculation since a lot of the information is right there. And you'll see in the global parameters that you have the diaphragm mass self-weight options. And it lists out whether you want to count the gravity items the deck or, and, and the deck or the deck, um, and also the lateral items. So you can choose to, to select those things to count for your seismic weight. You can also come in here, and you can tell the program to be doing the dynamic mass. So a lot of times this is a confusing number for folks. Um, the dynamic mass, or what we call here the dyne load, is what we call use it for the superimposed dead load. So there's a lot of times that maybe your post dead load here listed in this category might not be the exact same as the dynamic mass. Um, maybe you've overestimated that dynamic weight. Maybe you underestimated it. Um, there's times in the code that they mention you can do things for storage or permanent equipment um, or roof flat snow loads, things like that, that you may want to add to that load there for the dynamic mass. So we have a separate category, and that dynamic load there will be associated with what gets into your self-weight when you take your model from RISA floor into RISA 3 to do this calculation for you. Um, if you're just in RISA 3D, we don't have a lot of that smart information. We have a lot of different uh, categories and things like that, but we don't know what is the dead load. A lot of times people don't do uh, load categories in RISA 3D. So you, know, you have to tell the program which category or actually here, which load combination are we using for your seismic weight. And there's a drop-down list, and it will give you every single load combination you've created. So before you go in there, you're going to want to create your load combinations in RISA 3D, and then you're going to want to set up this parameter for yourself. And we'll see this all in practice once we get over to the RISA 3D model. So once we, we've got that load calculated, how is it going to be applied? Just like the wind, it's going to be applied as a point load per diaphragm. So we're going to calculate what gets applied on that diaphragm level or that level of the floor there. And we're going to calculate the weight and then find that story shear there per floor. And it's going to be resisted by the diaphragm and carried down the building into the foundation. So you've got a similar load pass, but um, we're doing it there 
based on the weight of the structure. Notional loads is the third load item that we want to talk about. So the definition of notional loads here I've listed out as the lateral loads that are applied to each framing level to account for the effects of the geometric imperfections and inelasticity or both. Um, what's this is kind of as we've always seen this here, you know, coming about as in the codes as the AIC 7, Appendix 7, and direct analysis method. We see that a lot. Um, we also see that we've got it, um, you know, in the newer codes in the 13th edition and the 14th edition. Uh, sometimes it's required, sometimes it's not. There's a there's a lot of times that I, as we look at models that come in, people are not using notional loads. Um, they're using adjusting their factors in different ways to get around the notional loads. Um, but one of the things that did get introduced was the ASE 7 2010. It does require notional loads for all structures. And the number, the, the quantity of that notional load went up. So it's going to be 1% of the dead load for that, which is a little bit different than what the steel folks have used in the past, which has been a lot, lot smaller, maybe um, a 0.2% there. So we're going to see 1%. And historically, what kind of happened here is that the seismic category of A uh, was removed out, out of the ASC 705. And so we see that the uh, this is sort of a replacement of that. Um, this is taking 1% of the entire dead load and applying it as a minimal force laterally. Um, so you may have already been accounting for this. Maybe this isn't really a new thing, but um, maybe you're seeing it in a different side here as the notional loads instead. So what I want to do is open up a model. I'm going to open up Risa Floor, and let's take a look at a model actually here. Risa Floor. Um, if you're not familiar with it, this is Risa Floor's a building analysis tool that we can use to design the entire building. I've just built a three-story uh, small building just to, to demonstrate some of the issues and the stuff that we just talked about. Um, so what we'll see here is that we've got, uh, this, is, this has got area loads in it. Um, inherently part of the Risa Floor model, you're going to see area loads on that model. Um, so right now, I'm going to minimize some of this here so we can see. Right now we've got an office area loading on here. Um, what that means to us is that in, as we take this model over to RISA 3D and we look at our area load definitions, we see that office area load has that dyne load that we talked about earlier. So that means that we have 10 pounds per square foot all over that for the dead load to calculate the self-weight. We also saw, talked earlier about where we keep all of that seismic weight information. And if you go back to your global parameters, you can see that you have a seismic tab here where you can fill out all the different parameters, but you also can check off here to include the gravity, the deck, and the lateral for the seismic weight. So I'm going to say OK. And I'm going to solve this model real quick, if I haven't already. It looks like I already solved it, but I'm going to solve it again. And we're going to see that it's going to run through an analysis and design all of the single members in this, in this model. Now, the only thing that's going to get carried over from this model into RISA 3D is the red elements. So those are the lateral ones. So in this model, I have some braced frames around my building, and those are the ones that are going to carry over using my director button on the top right corner. I click on RISA 3D. And I see here that the wind loads get populated. We saw this screen here, this automated wind loading, just a second ago. And what we see here is that we've got the ASE 705 exposure category, just like we talked about. And as I scroll down, I see an echo of what that information is. So it tells me the same information I just entered in. I also then start to see some of the calculated numbers here. So I'm um, seeing a KH, I'm seeing my windward CP, uh, all my, now I'm starting to see my Q values. So all of my, my pressures are being calculated here. It gives me a width and a length of the building, so it can tell me what the exposure in the windward and the leeward directions are. And lastly, but most important here, is going to be the forces in the X and Z direction. Note you're only seeing one force per level. So floor plan one, one fourth. Floor plan two, one fourth. So it's a little different. We're basically taking that uniform load and m turning it into one point load. So we'll see how that gets distributed and more as we talk about the diaphragms. But I want to show you that as you see that it's listed out here. What I would typically do in design is print this out. This would be my, my proof of what I did for my lateral loads in wind. Then I would say OK. And I'm going to jump over to the seismic tab here. Now, the seismic information is going to be very similar. We said we're going to lay out the load parameters. It also tells me the similar information of exactly what I entered in. 
But then below that, it tells me a little bit more of the calculated. This is the period that was then calculated and used. I have an upper limit and a method A here, and it looks like my method A was used. I have an importance factor. I also have tells me the design category, C. Uh, we've got here my base shear listed out um, in the X and the Z direction, and then I've got the governing equation there for that base shear. Um, each floor is also given a weight and then a force in each direction. So I'm seeing here that I've got a force in the X direction for one, and a Z direction for floor plan two, one, two, and three. I'm also calculating the center of gravity. So in, in your uh, seismic, what you're going to be doing is calculating that center of gravity. And below that, we can see that I've got a plus and minus. And what that is is for the accidental torsion. I have a 5% uh, accidental torsion that needs to be applied. So I'm going to calculate the length, apply that 5% there, and we'll see the, how that gets applied in a second. So I'm going to say OK. And I come into my of 3D model. Now, this model is only, like I said, just the lateral frames. I've got some braced frames in here. And what we can see is that I can just display some of these loadings. So I have dead load already on the model, live load. So just the portion of loading that came across from Risa floor got applied into Risa 3D. So just those dead loads, their, their little point loads and distributed loads that were carried across are there. Wind load in the X direction, we can see there that we've got, just like we saw a second ago, it's into each diaphragm. Now, that's a little bit, a lot of nodes to look at. I'm going to take the descriptors off there, and I'm going to show you the diaphragms for a second, and let's take a look. So we're looking down on the model, and let's just see how this gets applied. So if we zoom in, we see that that, that goes right into the diaphragm, one point load per level, and that's the wind load in the X direction. If you're ever in doubt of what you're looking at on the bottom left corner, it says wind load in the X direction. We can also view wind load in the Z direction. So let's just flip our model around so we can see it in the Z direction. And we see that that's one point load per that, uh, per that level. The other thing we can do is we can see that there are partial loads in here. And I'm going to look at this in isometric view for a second. We have extra kind of a diamond shape of nodes per level. And if I show you here, there's wind loads in the, X, the partial Z direction. And we can go to the partial Z direction in the other side. So we're basically trying to do some eccentric loading there for you. In the, for wind loads and for earthquake loads, you'll see some of that eccentric loading. So we can see kind of bounce around that. The other thing we can do with this, well, now that we've got our model in place, is we can add those notional loads. So one thing to kind of keep straight in your mind is that anything out of plane happens here in Risa 3D. Anything in plane, like the, the area loading for the vertical loads, happens in Risa floor. So a notional load is an out of plane load, so we're going to say insert notional loads. By the way, if you ever get lost and wondered what your wind loads were, but you didn't want to go back to Risa floor and come back to Risa 3D, you can see you can just pop it up with this window. I, this is a this is a spot where a lot of times people get lost. So if you ever say go, you just say insert, and you can find all the different kinds of loadings you have there. So we're going to go to notional loads. Now, as I mentioned, we'll, we'll sort of assume that it's going to be the AOC 710, um, so that we actually need one percent. So we're going to put 1% there in the X direction and the Z direction. And then we're going to choose here, oh, looks like I need a load combination for that story weight. So let's jump in and create a load combination. So dead load. And let's change this basic load case category to dead load. OK, with a factor of 1. So I'm going to say insert, back again, notional loads. And I'm going to jump in here to dead load. And I'm going to calculate that dead load. So now I can see that it calculated to the weight based on that, ca that story weight I just defined. The forces in the x and the z direction are calculated, and then it's placed into the center of gravity. So I'm going to say OK. And let's see here. So we can now find those notional loads in the x direction. We see that they're applied right there into the diaphragm. And in the z direction, they're applied into the diaphragm. So you do need a diaphragm for, the, for Risa to calculate that for you. One of the tricks you could do is to say, hey, I don't have a diaphragm. I really do need to apply those notional loads. What should I do? Well, you could do is create a diaphragm for yourself. Even if you don't have one, put one in, uh, find, you know, define it like I just did, take that number. It did all of that, that calculation there for you. It found that. You can go over to the notional loads and take a quick look at this. You see that, oh, OK, this is the force that was placed on that. 
And then I could say maybe I could just distribute it. If I don't have a diaphragm, I would then take that diaphragm off, and I could distribute it into maybe into the, the, um, the lateral resisting members that I wanted to as point loads or distributed loads, and I can go from there. So that's kind of an easy way if you don't have that. Otherwise, you could calculate that off on your own. So we've got notional loads, and one of the things here, we've got all of the, the different pieces. I want to show what happens when you don't have a diaphragm. As we, we just sort of mentioned that, that you don't have a diaphragm, what are you going to do? Let me pop into that. So earthquakes and wind loads without diaphragms. So what happens is you're going to be you're going to have to calculate those loads outside of RISA. Um, you can calculate the wind loads, the seismic loads, all of those can be um, calculated manually. And what you're going to do is you're going to apply those wind loads in a variety of different ways. So you can apply them as point loads. Um, for earthquake loads, that's probably the most typical way to do it is apply them as point loads. For distributed line loads, um, you can do that as well. You, another good way is area loading, especially for wind, because that's sort of how we think about area loading for wind. Um, we think about it as a uh, applied to the side of a building, for example, um, as an area. So for area loads, there's a couple different things we can do for wind uh, on the walls. On the walls, what we can do is we can do a distribution based on either a one-way. So if we assume that the siding is ribbed in one direction, and it's going to help distribute those forces in one way, um, and that's just load attribution is what we're talking about. So we're not talking about the design of, the, of anything. We're just saying that the load gets distributed in that one direction, and that ribbing of, um, sort of helps us get that, that distribution. That will be what we call that for the area loads one way. Uh, the other way you can do it is two-way, so an isotropic siding. For some reason, you have a way that the siding can distribute it in all directions. Um, it's not ribbed. It's just a flat sheet, for example. Um, you can, you can uh, apply it that way. Even possibly if you had a tilt-up wall or something like that that was going to be actually blowing wall, uh, against your building, and in all directions it was going to be distributing loads. Um, that, that's a little bit of a, 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 little, uh, you know, a, a leap, but otherwise you, if you can get a two-way distribution, that would be your, your other option. The third option is called an open structure, and that is when there's no siding. There's, no lo there's nothing there to catch the load, and this is, um, this is an interesting type of uh, load, load distribution. It, we'll see this in action in just a second. I want to show you that loading done on the model. But what it does mean is that it is not calculating the full area of, the load, of how it's dis uh, applied to the building. It's just, this, this just applying it where it meets a member. For example, if we apply a load to a tower, um, this is a very a cell, a cellular tower. There is no siding. There's nothing to catch the wind. So we would only be catching wind in uh, where the flange thickness uh, of maybe the the legs of the of even the um, bracing. Anything that would be meeting wind would get that loading. But this is not sort of a an, an, uh, partially enclosed structure. Sometimes people confuse that with this open structure. So we'll look at a good example of this in our model, and maybe we can see it a little bit in action a little bit better. The good thing to mention for always for wind, wind is always perpendicular to member local axis. Um, so that means that it's, we're going to choose a perp, which is the type of loading uh, direction, but that's called perpendicular. And so that's the way. All wind gets applied, and I don't know that there's a very much way that you could ever tell the program, um, you know, you could tell it to do something that way other ways, but the code really always says it goes perpendicular to the local axis of the member, um, be it a roof or a wall. So let's jump into a model here. I'm going to close down Resolve 3D, and we're going to not say that. And what we're going to do is we're going to open up Resa 3D directly. So this would be when you have a model that you're doing from Resa without a RISA floor model, and hang on a sec here, let me open that up. So um, anything, this model that I'm opening is going to actually be a industrial type model. Um, so I just built something that looked maybe to me like a, sort of like a pipe rack, but um, whatever I could uh, imagine that would not really require a, a diaphragm. Uh, so in this model that you can see here, what I've got is I've got some cross bracing horizontally and vertically. Um, I added a little bit of dead load to this model, just some distributed loads, um, some dead and live load, but um, not too much going on. What I really wanted to just show you was sort of demonstrate the different types of loading here that we could do in this type of model. 
So in here we see is we can apply, um, I'm going to see here, the wind load in the x direction. And now what you're looking at here is wind load directly here on as an area load. And I only did it for this, this frame below, and these two frames, the three frames. Um, and I drew it in four points. And what you can see by that arrow is that this is a one-way load distribution. So what I'm telling the program is to apply the loads to the columns in, and not to the beams. Those are the horizontal members. I'm telling it to go just horizontally to the columns, not not, excuse me, to the, to the beams, which is the vertical load distribution. So if we run this combination, and I'm going to show you also in the X, Z direction, I did the same thing. I told the program just apply it in the horizontal direction, as if we're running rib, decking, uh, rib siding across this in the horizontal direction. So I saw, I'm going to solve just those two load combinations. And I'm going to see here, it asks me to run P delta. I, I'm not going to run P delta for that one. But what we can see is that the load gets distributed to my model to just those columns. And it's about 144 uh, kips, uh, or pounds, excuse me, pounds per running foot that gets applied on those columns. And if I scroll down one more, I can see that then in this direction, it's about uh, 248 pounds per running foot applied to those columns. So what I did internally, it took those four points, and that uh, took that large rectangular area and applied what I applied was 20 pounds per square foot, and it allocated that to the members here that I told it in that direction. So it's pretty simple, just kind of taking an area load, it gets tributary area distributed to those members. Now, the other method I mentioned, which was the open structure. So if I'm going to solve, let me just solve the open structure, and we'll see how that happens. So if I solve just the open, the same two directional, what we had here, I'm going to, let me show you that so you can see before we get into how it got applied. But the open structure, again, is just 20 pounds per square foot. And it's in both directions, the X and the Z. You'll note that it's a little bit different color, just to designate to you that it's not the exact same. And that open wind then created a transient load, which did it every single place that the wind blew through this structure, or that area load was exposed in this direction. So we can see that the magnitude's a lot smaller, because really what's being applied is if I render this for a second, what I can see is that it's just the web here that's being, this, this depth of this member is being applied that area of 20 pounds per square foot. But the entire bay from, from node 1 to node 21, those, this whole bay is not getting wind. It's just what was exposed to it. So we see that just the, um, the, you know, the beams are exposed and the columns are exposed. But what's interesting when you do it this way is there's no shielding. So it's, we're doing it as if everything is being expo exposed to it. Um, so if we look down at transient in the other direction, we see also the same thing. Um, just the loads here in that direction are being exposed to it. Now, you'll also notice that when we looked at the, the winds load in the other direction, when we were looking at the, the, the true wind loads apply more, more normally when you have a siding attached to that or some kind of cladding, um, what, what we do here, we see that we apply this. Let's see, I'm going to solve just one more time. I'm just going to solve this load combination. And I'm just going to solve the x direction. Okay, so we just solved the X direction, and I'm going to just show here. So we just applied it to those columns. It didn't go to the members behind it, and that's just inherently how an area load, typically you're just finding the members that you are looking to, to, to solve and, and apply loads to that. The other thing is it's, um, it's not going to apply to those braces. While the open structure is, it's really going to apply it to almost everything in your structure, and it's not going to shield like that. So they're just two different methods. Um, you, you may find uses for, for either one in different ways. Um, the other load combinations I wanted to show you while we're in here, um, I did do a roof wind load. So um, I used the WLLZ, excuse me, plus R. And what I can show you, let's take a look at what that is. That's just an area load that I applied manually. I just put this, and I, again, just used a 20 pounds per square foot. You typically would be doing um, a lot more calculations to find a more accurate number, but 20 sounded like a reasonable number here. And I apply it to that roof. And the way I applied this one is in a two-way. 
So it's not a one-way distribution. Um, so what we're going to see is that the load goes everywhere on that plane that I applied it to, not just the, the horizontal direction, not just the vertical direction. So let's solve that load combination for a second, and we'll see that distribution. Now, what you're noticing when I'm showing you what it does behind the scenes, it creates a transient area load. And I'm, I'm doing it pretty quickly, so I want to make sure I make that clear. There always is a transient load combination, or, and excuse me, a load category that gets created for us, and it, it shows us what we did with that area load. So we don't want it to be black box. We want you to see, when you saw that, that area load, what happened there. And that's what we're displaying on our screen. So we're going to solve that there for a second. I just cleared my solution, but let's solve it again. And we'll see here, we'll look at that transient load, and we then see there's that load that we had there. Um, that's the roof load. That's in two ways. It's loading it in all different directions. And one of the things to point out is that when I told you that the wind load gets applied to the perpendicular, it gets applied to the perpendicular local axis. So what's happening in here? Does everybody see that it's applying it in the Y and the Z direction? So it's bringing it, the load into its components and applying it in that perpendicular. So it's, it's actually doing exactly what we wanted it to do. We did not want to have just a, a vertical load um, in, the, in the Y direction or an X direction, a uh, horizontal load. Wind is, needs to be applied perpendicular. So that's what it's doing there. And I think you can see that really well in this example. Uh, we see the components being broken out there. Uh, so you've got the, the two-way distribution, you've got your one-way distribution. Um, the last way I did here in this model to show you is I just wanted to show the what you might do for point loads. So earthquake loads, a lot of times what you're doing is you're taking your earthquake calculations and you're distributing it into the frames that you have in here. So I kind of put some frames together and I put some point loads. They are not going to get to any transient loads. They're just going to be run on the model by themselves. Um, and we, we can run it, but there's not a lot to see on that one. I'll just run one single combination, and we see here that it's going to be run in there. The, we could look at the deflected shape. That might be a very evident thing for you to, to work with is the deflected shape. So let's talk about what happens here. Let's go back to our, our um, quickly to a slide and see uh, what's happening in the diaphragm. So. We are, when we're doing our automated lateral loads, we are requiring a diaphragm. And as I mentioned, that may or may not fit your case um, for all times. So you, you want to know, okay, what, what is available in RESA 3D and RESA floor? And what is available is a flexible or a rigid diaphragm. And what you want to ask yourself is what you want to do there. So in a flexible diaphragm, you want to say, what is a flexible diaphragm? And, and the way the code describes a flexible diaphragm actually gives you a lot of flexibility, um, <laughs> ironically. But it means what I kind of, as I read through the code a little bit to see when a flexible diaphragm is, is allowed to be used, it seems like there's, there is a lot of times where you could use a flexible diaphragm. Metal decking that's not topped, uh, wood deck, things like that um, can actually easily be done as a flexible diaphragm. Uh, a rigid diaphragm, that's where you start to say, how stiff is your diaphragm, and can it be considered a rigid diaphragm? Um, again, the code gives you a pretty good idea of the concrete slabs are allowed, and even concrete filled composite decking is allowed to be considered rigid. Um, and then you follow it, you can idealize it, and that's what the, you know, the code actually, ASE 7 says, you can idealize it as flexible or idealize it as rigid um, if you fit those, those parameters. If you go outside of that, you're going to be in the semi-rigid diaphragm. So that's going to be beyond the scope of this webinar, but you could do a semi-rigid diaphragm. It is not automated at this time. So you, we, you could, uh, one, a webinar to watch would be talking about the plates. We have a plates webinar. That might be a really good spot to, to hit if you're doing a semi-rigid diaphragm. But the, the opportunity to do a flexible and a, and a rigid diaphragm are in RESA floor, and RESA 3D has a rigid diaphragm. And one of the things to ask yourself is how does this really distribute the loads? Um, that's the piece that's really going to be most important. At the end of the day, if you define it as a flexible diaphragm and if you define it as a uh, rigid diaphragm, what does that do to my model? Because uh, a lot of times folks will want to try to do both, and that's a good idea to understand it. So when we're looking at this here, I wanted to show 
show an example of this. It's the it's a diaphragm example where we see here this this is shear walls. I placed shear walls in. Um, this is easily could be just like a moment frame or a brace frame uh, layout, but it's a just orthogonal setup where we have wind and seismic uniform loads applied um, in one direction, and we have a diaphragm in place. And if we talk about this as a rigid diaphragm. When it's as a rigid diaphragm, the diaphragm moves rigidly. As we apply those loads, they distribute to the lateral resisting system, and it rigidly moves away here together. You can see that the diaphragm is rigidly moving, and each wall is receiving one-third. There's three walls. They're equally as stiff, and they're getting one-third of the load into each wall. And that's kind of how the rigid diaphragm theory works. You distribute the lateral loads to the, the stiffness level of the, of the lateral resisting system. So in these equal three walls, they're getting one third of the load. In a flexible system, we're going to see that the flexible system does not move uh, or does not t resist that load um, in the same manner. It's basically going to allow the load to just transfer through as a uh, mechanism to transfer load rather than actually resisting or distributing that load. So it's more of a tributary area method. So we see as we push on that flexible diaphragm, it bows out of place and we can see that we've got um, a quarter of the load in, in the outside walls as a tributary area of those are one quarter um, of the total and the inside wall is having has, has double there. So it has looking at half of the load of the uniform load is going to that inside wall. And that's just tributary area. So we just think about that wall getting a quarter and a quarter and a half of inside of the middle. So what happens when this is a very simplistic view, right? We're just looking at three shear walls. But as we look at it, kind of as we start to break these walls up, with that rigid diaphragm, um, if we don't have as many, if we have two walls that have the equal stiffness on the outside, and the inside wall is looking at half of that stiffness. So maybe we put a post here or a column and connect it with a, a collector. But we're not actually doing uh, the same type of walls anymore. Now the loads are going to be distributed based on the stiffness. So the outside walls are going to see uh, about a fourth of that, or excuse me, you know, 40% of the load. And the inside wall is only going to see about 20% or half of that because it's got half the stiffness. Um, so this is where you start to see the distribution of load really changing in, in your model based on a rigid diaphragm. Where on a hand calc method, you might still kind of use this quarter, quarter, half, even if you had a collector element there. So you would just drag that straight into the collector and right into your post, for example. So maybe a wood building, this would be a very, also a very easy way to do it in your hand calc method, where you just use that tributary area still, no matter what was there. It wasn't based on the stiffness, it was just based on its tributary, so it would be the same amount of loading. Um, so that, that would be something that we would see here. And I'm going to show, let's open up a, another model. I'm going to open up a Risa Floor model for a second. And in, coming in from Risa Floor, you can do a flexible diaphragm automatically. Uh, what I'm going to here open up, this is a, a wood building, which is a, very, is a good example of a flexible diaphragm. It doesn't have to be the only uh, example of a flexible diaphragm, but it, it does do a nice good example of that. And I, I built a wood uh, structure here with, uh, also I wanted to start to demonstrate that the sloped roofs that I had for you. Earlier we talked about the sloping of the roof and how that gets applied. And so I like this model here because I can see um, all the lateral elements here. I'm actually bringing my entire roof system over into Risa 3D. So we're going to apply all that wind load in there. And in this type of a bearing wall structure here, we see that the, on the entire outside perimeter walls are going to be lateral. Um, so I'm going to solve this model really fast and then take it over to Risa 3D. And we're going to see that this is a flexible diaphragm. So we're going to have loads distributed just a little bit differently. Um, and the fir on first blush, when we look at it, Actually, everything is pretty close to the, to the rigid diaphragm. All of our loading uh, that we see in, when we get over here to the wind and the seismic stuff are going to see point loads. And I'm going to show you that here in one sec. We're optimizing all these members, taking just a second to run through that. And we've got all, our, all of our shear walls designed here for lateral, for just for gravity loads. But when you see over here at Risa 3D, what I'll notice is even though I have a flexible diaphragm, the load calculator 
here, this load automated calculator, doesn't really know anything about that. It's still going to give me forces in the x and forces in the z direction, just like we saw earlier with a rigid diaphragm. In the seismic, we also see forces in the x direction here, and we see our, our uh, center of gravity still. We see our little eccentric stuff. All that's already the accidental torsion stuff is still here. Um, so no difference until you really get to running the analysis and then seeing where it distributed those loads. So we're going to still see what we said is the wind load in the x direction. I'm going to turn that on, and you see those point loads floating around in my diaphragm. Um, so it's a little harder to see, but let me, I'm going to zoom in here and turn off my node label so we can see a little bit better. Um, so you just still get those x direction loads. You still get the z direction loads. Um, nothing's changed there, but when we, we run the analysis, we're going to start to see a little bit different things happening. So what I want to show you here is I'm just going to run these wind loads in the x direction and wind load in the z direction. I'm going to solve those two load combinations. And when it gets those two combinations get solved, I, by the way, I, all throughout this presentation, I didn't create full load combinations. We'll hit that at the end of it now, but I just want to make sure we just targeted what we were looking at. So. Um, not quite realistic as, as of far, but once we get to load combinations, we'll see that a little farther. So once we have our loads here, uh, we've got our wind loads X and Z direction solved. What you remember is we have those transient area loads. So let's see what happens there. In the, when we solve the transient uh, basic load case 8, which is the X direction, what created the transient loads actually distributed those loads to the lateral resisting system there, which was my shear walls. So you'll see those loads only get distributed to the shear walls. Even though there's sort of all sorts of other members, these are what the members are, the elements are that are distributing them. So this is what we would have kind of easily called our flexible diaphragm. We applied loads to uh, the, the whole face of this X direction, and then it distributed it to those elements that can resist it. Okay, and that's based on the, that tributary area. So we're taking the tributary of the wind direction here probably around grid line four, uh, back to this wall, maybe grid line seven and a half, back to this wall, and six is getting a portion of both of those there based on its tributary. So that's kind of in the X direction. In the Z direction, we see the same thing. It's being distributed to the walls there. So this was not going to happen if we had a rigid diaphragm. If we had a rigid diaphragm, that would have been just dumped into the diaphragm level, and then whatever was the stiffness level of these walls, that's where that load would travel, okay? So that would rigidly connect to that level um, and that top node, so every one of those top nodes would be rigidly connected to that point load, and that's where you would get that rigid diaphragm action. Um, we also can see in this model, this is a good model to demonstrate, the roof loads. So when we have the flexible diaphragms are typically done for the roof live loads, or excuse me, roof wind loads, and we can solve that batch solution here and we see WLX plus roof and in the, both in the X and the Z direction. And we can still see a heap of different loads here applied. And this first one we're looking at is in the X direction. So as we're applying loads in the, oh, I think we're actually might be in the Z direction where we're displayed. Yes, this is the X direction. Sorry about that. So in the X direction, as we apply that, these are the uh, elements that are being picked up on this roof level. And in, if we looked at this before as an area load, and we can see before the model got run, this is as an area load. This was done here as like a positive and a negative area load. You can see kind of as it gets distributed sort of exactly like that picture I showed earlier from the ASE 7, I think it's figure 6-6 six, six, there, it shows you that positive and negative, that's being applied to that roof area load. We can see that happens on that transient, similar to that. Same thing in the Z direction. We can see that positive Z direction uh, gives us a plus and a minus. Like so we're seeing the uplift on one side, and we can see how that gets transla translated into a transient area load. So all these loads there are going to be attributed based on their roof, um, their roof slope, and what we're finding there. So once we here, I'm going to pop back over to floor for a sec, and I'm going to go here. So once we have all our loads in place. So be it whether you design those loads or whether uh, you put them in uh, manually or you used our automatic generator, you're still going to need to address your load combinations. And the load combinations can get kind of 
very, very complex. Seismic is the first one to talk about, and that one has got a lot of complexity. Uh, we have a seismic load generator, and we have gravity, wind, and seismic. Uh, we'll talk about seismic here, and what you do is you pick your, your, load, uh, your load combination region and the code that you want to use. Um, so maybe IBC, we have ASE 7. Um, if you're in a foreign code, you can choose one of those. And then you can choose any one of these options. These get, these get uh, here kind of overwhelming, so let's break them down. So reversible. All reversible is doing is telling the program to use a positive or negative load factor on that. So if we say um, we, we don't have a reversible checked on, every, all the different load combinations are going to be created for seismic, and um, there's going to be no reversal of loads. Um, so if we want to reverse it with a, just a, a direct negative sign in front of it, we will create an additional load combination with a negative sign in front of the factor. And we can see that in, as we do it. Uh, redundancy factor. That one you can choose to, to include the, the row. Um, it, there's a laundry list of different reasons why row should be 1.0. If row is not, if it needs to be more than that, you can set row in the program and then you can include that. Um, there's also times when you need to include the vertical component, so what we call the EV. And what we, if you want to check that box there for you, what you'll find is the, the load combination will, uh, will actually ha contain something that says, oops, I'm going to, sorry, back, bump back, it will say 0.2 SDS times DL. It will actually have that. You won't see EV, but this is what EV is. So the vertical component of your of your earthquake. So you'll get that added into the load combination. You also can include the non-orthogonal. Um, so in the part of the code that says the direction of loading, there's sometimes it, when it's uh, included for B category, but typically it's just for C and higher, and that would include the non-orthogonal. Um, this is a separate item than the eccentric part. So the accidental torsion here is where we designate it with X and Z with eccentric loading. Um, we also have the non-orthogonal. So these are two different items, and they'll happen um, if you, so you want to check them twice. Um, we've interpreted that in a way that it basically happens twice um, in those two different times. Um, the overstrength option down below, you've got uh, load combinations that may be required, and you'll see very similar types of things um, for overstrength. And that would be probably where we would get more into the seismic detailing portion of, the, of um, RISA 3D. And we have seismic detailing, um, a whole tab and a whole, probably another webinar that we need to go into that. So I don't have time to go into that. But what you would want to do is address all your, um, your seismic rules in order to get your overstrength load combinations. And the reason why we probably wouldn't hit that on this is that this wouldn't be for all types of members or buildings. It may be just for your cords and collectors or if you're doing discontinuous members. Um, things like that, but this wouldn't be for all. So we're going to skip that for right now. But I'll show you. We can show you where that is. Um, the other thing is for wind load combinations. So that was just seismic, but in wind we also have the same type of stuff. You've got you can apply loading to your model uh, for for the 2D, the X and Z, um, X and Z with eccentric. Now the quartering X and Z with eccentric and quartering. This is just to wind. Similar to that non orthogonal that we saw for the 30% additional, this is kind of this, uh, once ever we see this, this picture, it rings a bell, oh yeah, there's this eccentric and there's a case uh, that requires us to do that, and we can see that the eccentric here with the quartering, so it, it makes us actually do the quartering of them at the same time, and that's all with the X and Z with eccentric quartering. Um, if you don't want to get to that level, which I think some uh, sometimes you're allowed to not get to this level, um, then you could just choose with eccentric or just X and Z. Um, you also want to generate the roof wind loads if that's something you've done from Risa Floor. And both the seismic and the wind have this notional loads to, um, added to the wind load combinations. So you can choose to add those or not. Um, and let's take a quick look. I'm going to open up my Risa uh, frame for a second. Just jump back in. Let's see here. Um, so I'm going to actually close Risa floor, and let's just open up in Risa 3D the, um, that industrial frame for a second. Just take a quick look at this load combination generator. Um, it's pretty important to have that load combination uh, set up properly, obviously, if you put all these loads in and didn't generate your combinations right, it would be all for naught. Okay, so one of the things is that this is some, a newer spot since we've added a lot of the seismic in there you may not be familiar with. In your global parameters, you have a seismic tab. 
So in here, you can enter in all of these things that are required for the load combinations. There's your row. If you ever were confused, hey, how does RISA know what row to use? Well, you told it um, right here in the load combination, uh, excuse me, in the, in the uh, global parameters. In the overstrength right here, you've got the, the omega. So all the different values, when we were talking about doing that EV, you've got to, you've got to put the values in here for, in order to get the proper um, EV listed out. So you're, wanna, you're gonna wanna go into seismic there if you wanna use those values. So we're open up a load combination. Uh, let's see here, I'm gonna open up the load combination. I'm gonna open up the load combination generator. It's at the top there. And what you'll see is that you've got, I just built some silly load combinations just to demonstrate for us, as I mentioned. But what I really wanna do is create ones that are useful, um, that we'd really wanna use for design. So maybe I could use the IBCASD. Um, if I didn't use roof live loads or snow loads or rain loads, I'd probably want to uncheck that, okay? And in my model, I didn't. So I'm going to uncheck those so I don't get uh, miscellaneous load combinations. I, let's say we are using 2010 now, so it's important for us to use X and Z for notional. So I can generate that. I'm assuming we created notional loads in this model. Um, so let's take a quick look. It, once I do that, it generated the dead loads with the notionals. It generated dead and live, and then just dead loads there. So what I also want to do here, I'm going to jump back over to wind, and I'm going to create my wind loads. Well, I'm going to create them with the eccentric and quartering, and I'm also going to do here, this one doesn't have, uh, let's see, do I have roof wind loads? Yes, I do. So let's make sure we include that. Um, I'm going to skip the notional on this one just to minimize some of our combinations. And let me close that. And what I can see in here, I'm starting to grow pretty fast. But what I've got is I've got wind loads in the different directions. Starting out, I've got a wind load in the X direction, and it adds the roof in there. In the Z directions, and it starts adding the, all the different. And here I see my some of my quartering um, loads here. They're down to 0.5625. And as I scroll down here, I see all these different load combinations. So it's getting kind of heavy. The other thing I can do is do my seismic. So if I go over to seismic, I can then do eccentric. I can choose all of these. Let's choose some of these here. We'll see how they get applied. Um, and I'm going to leave off the notionals. So I'm going to generate all of those. And I'm going to close that. So let me scroll down and see some of this. So one of the things that you'll see, so row is listed out in there. When I click on it, it shows, displays it as R. H O, but you'll see it in the Greek format here listed on there. Um, you'll also see that we've got, I did the, uh, the SDS times the DL. You've got that listed out and the factor there. So you've got it in there. Um, and that is being multiplied by 0.2. So you've got that listed there. And then you've got um, all the different dead loads plus that. Now let me just show you the, the omega as well, um, just so you have an idea. I'm going to just actually do X and Z with omega. And you can see that. So if you're going to use the overstrength combinations, you've got them there. And you'll see they're listed as ohm times the ELX and the ELZ. So the load combinations are, are getting pretty big. And what I might suggest to you when you start working with these, you can easily bog down a model and so that you won't be able to run it. And it'll take you, you know, your lunch hour in order to solve the model. Um, not so enjoyable when you want to get things done. So what I do suggest is maybe monitoring what you solve. Um, you can use this checkbox to solve things uh, only that you want. So you might unclick that, maybe unselect the entire that uh, solve checkbox. So what I'm doing is I'm saying block fill, and I'm putting nothing in all of those solve checkboxes. And then what I might do is run uh, just a couple ones that I know that are going to be contributing to the model, maybe just the dead load. And then maybe I know that this is one of the contributing ones that is going to be the, the um, the worst case, and I can then sort of pick through and pick some of the bad ones that I want um, to be examining together. Um, but maybe th some of these are redundant. They're going to be. It just depends on what you've got there. Um, or they're just not going to contribute to the overall design. Maybe they just, um, they're not, they're very low loads. So you can sort of work with that, and that's what I would suggest um, when you solve this model is working with this, this solve checkbox. Uh, what happens with this solve checkbox? I can still run one of the ones that's unsolved as a solve current or as a solving a single combination by uh, choosing, choosing that. But what I can, when I'm doing the envelope or the batch solution, it's going to look to see whatever has the solve checkbox turned on. And that's the one that's going to get run. So let's see here. Uh, 
Lastly, I just kind of want to talk about additional resources. We've got a lot in our RISA 3D help file and reference manual based on uh, what we just talked about. The RISA News um, is a, a site that has lots of quick tips on how to do things and how to work in the models. Um, so I do encourage you to go to that site. Um, you can always actually uh, ask support, you know, email support at RISA Tech uh, or RISA.com. And then our user's guides are available on our website too, so it walks you through how to do things. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. I, I did go pretty fast, and I, I know there might be some questions, but I hope I covered um, a variety of different topics, um, including you know building design as well as industrial uses as well as um, all the different types of scenarios you might have. Uh, if you have beyond that, also feel free to in email us directly at info at Thank you so much for attending today.